Uh, first off, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, unless I'm mistaken, this is the first conference talk related to Leptos um, that anyone has ever given. So uh, this will be an interesting experience for all of us. Uh, for my own curiosity's sake, how many of you have heard of Leptos before you came to the talk and the conference and all that stuff? Interesting, a pretty good number of you. How many of you actually tried it? Again, a pretty good number of you. So um, it's really been amazing how far this has come in the time that it has existed, and I feel very lucky to have contributed um, at all, right? For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ben Wasovich. Uh, I am uh, one of the core contributors of Leptos Lead Maintainer. We don't really have a formal structure. Um, it's basically me and Greg Johnston, the founder, uh, maintaining it al along with the community. So uh, unlike some of our other frameworks, we don't have any money or funding, so we're all volunteers, you know, which is fun. I've been a web developer for about four years. I started with React and JS, and I'm still doing that, but now I do Rust when I can. Uh, my first PR to Leptos was about 15 months ago. Um, but Leptos itself has only existed for about 16 and a half months, so uh, pretty early in the process, right? Uh, because everybody has one of these uh, socials, um, I have a blog that occasionally gets some views, uh, Mastodon, LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find on the internet, so if you have any questions or just want to reach out, you know, please do so. I want to shout out Greg, as I mentioned. He's the creator of Leptos. He built the uh, reactive runtime, and he remains our reactive runtime expert. Um, without him, the framework wouldn't exist as it is. So shout out to Greg, who is back in the United States. So I have two goals with this presentation. Um, one is to introduce Leptos. A bunch of you already know it, but I'm assuming a bunch of other people don't. Uh, and then we're going to talk about why you might want to choose it over uh, for a front-end web application, right? And I think there are some compelling reasons for that that we'll, we'll definitely get into here. So Leptos is a full-stack web framework that lets you leverage the power of Rust and fine-grained reactivity to deliver interactive, stable, and powerful web applications, right? It's like a dictionary you know, description. Um, and the short version is that it lets you build nice looking websites, right? It does that performantly. Um, the rest is all kind of buzzwords that we've all adopted in the web space, right? Um, Leptos, for sure. I thought I would take the chance, um, the time, to show you some of the examples of sites that people have built with Leptos. One of the questions that I always seem to keep, that I keep getting is, you know, are there any commercial users, right? We're only a year plus some um, old, and I'm thankful to say that we do actually have a few of them that I can show you today. Uh, one of them is Patter, uh, started by um, Rakshish. Uh, it is a Kubernetes platform for deploying apps. Uh, they built their control uh, interface and their and marketing page with Leptos, right? Oops. I've got to go back to my slides here. Rust Adventure, if any of you met Chris Piscardi or know about Chris Piscardi from the community, he rewrote his entire video workshop platform oops, in Leptos with Rust. Um, very, not, very lovely work with that. Um, looks very modern, right? A little while ago, um, a Rust contributor put out a Rusty Tube site, which is basically a custom front end to YouTube built with Leptos, right? So you've got a lot of um, variety in here. And then the California Beach Volleyball Association, <laughs> admittedly a little bit of a random uh, a site, is also been ported to Leptos, and they seem fairly happy with it unless they're, you know, not telling me. <laughs> so, whoops, we'll go on through. So I thought I'd take the chance, uh, I, I kind of had a debate here about whether to 
try to do a little tutorial via slides or try to do a little tutorial via um, some kind of live demo. And I've settled on a live demo, so we're going to try to do that and learn a little bit about Leptos while we're doing that. Um, The question always comes up, right, what is fine-grained reactivity? If you remember from the definition that we gave, Leptos is a fine-grained reactive framework. Um, and, a lot, and that's become the trend in the industry, usually by talking about signals. Um, every framework except for React has either had signals, is implementing signals, or is doing something related to signals at this point. Uh, it's the trait du jour. So, I thought, I always have a laugh with this. Um, it's a little bit of a deep cut. We'll get into it. Basically, fine-grained reactivity is the idea that you can take certain bits of reactive elements, um, of a bit of data, an equation, something like that, and you can keep track of who is accessing it, and you can update only the things in your view, in your web app, that, or whatever, that depend on it, right? That's what makes it fine-grained. A lot of the signals applications are not as fine-grained, you know, they, and they are looking at updating more than that at some boundary. Like maybe they update the component, maybe they update the page, you know, whatever. Fine-grained, you have to update the specific thing, you know, that depends on it. Talked a little bit about signals. Uh, here's an example of a signal from the Leptos framework. Uh, it's basically a bit of data that we put into a wrapper type so that we can do things when you either access it via get secret or write to it with write secret. You can kind of see here this is a string type. Rust Nation is the best. Um, and that is a, si a signal. This is our first Leptos component. Um, I put this in here not so much to talk about components. We'll talk about components in a bit. But I put it in here to kind of demonstrate fine-grained reactivity, right? So if you look at this thing, we've got that same create signal thing in our components. We've got our view macro that generates uh, HTML from a combination of HTML, CSS, and those little bits of Rust in the curly brackets. Uh, and we have a form handler that updates when you type in it. And the thing that makes it fine-grained reactive, right, and the way that this works is that we know that the call to dot .get on, this, on that get secret item, every time we do that, we keep track of who depends on it. So when then whenever we call uh, write secret, we know that we need to update this little bit of, of the interface, right? Only the little bit between the curly brackets. There are a lot of closures in our framework precisely because we need to rerun little bits. Um, unlike some of the other things that you might be used to, components will only run once. If I change the secret, the static stuff in this uh, example won't change, right? And that's always fun. The difference between that kind of framework and a DOM framework is that basically, say in React, you update a bit of data, they don't really know exactly what depends on it, so they just re-render some version of the whole thing, whether that's a page or a component, uh, depending on kind of how you set it up. And that's fine, it works pretty well, but it's not nearly as efficient um, as signals can be. So. Leptos will let you build almost any kind of site with almost any kind of method that you want, right? We have client-side rendering support where almost all of the work happens on the client, right? Page rendering and whatnot. And we have server-side rendering support with and without hydration so that you can do that as well. CSR, or client-side rendering, is about serving HTML, JS, and WebAssembly files. Um, just as files, right? So it can run on any place that'll let you serve files. We send down the HTML and the JS, like this sample here. You can kind of see there's absolutely nothing in the body there. And the JS and WebAssembly will fill that in, dependent on you know, what you want, what route you're navigating to. That's client-side rendering. We have an example of what that looks like with the Hacker News example over here. It's one of our uh, one of our examples in the Leptos repository. 
Um, this one is doing client-side rendering. So you can kind of see here that we pull in all of the files, we wait until they're loaded all the way, and then we run it. And you can see at the bottom that the, there's, a, there's an API request to news, right? So the disadvantage to this, besides a larger bundle size from having to have all the HTML generation stuff inside of it, is that those data queries cannot occur until after, right? Until after we've loaded the whole file. This is artificially slowed down. It does not take this long <laughs> to load the files, but it's easy to see kind of how that works. SSR is basically the opposite. We do most of the HTML rendering on the server, and then we populate it later with little bits of data, async stuff that we need to fetch to make the page load. That's hydration. Uh, in Leptos, specifically by default, we then navigate on the client. So uh, after that, it will generate the HTML on the clients and only fetch stuff from the server that it needs, like uh, from the API, basically. And this is what that looks like, the same example in SSR. If you notice here, there is no data fetch at the end of the loading. And that's because that is now streamed down as a result of the basic page load. So if you're doing a bunch of data fetching, maybe that's something that you want to do. All right, so I thought, um, as I mentioned earlier, that we could do a little demo. Uh, I put together uh, a really basic starter to build a counter app where you can get some data from the server and you can update it, and you can kind of see how that works inside of Leptos, right? So let me wander over here to our, uh, to my laptop and see how this looks. Uh, can everybody read that or do I need to make the font bigger? Bigger? Okay. Um, Let's try, okay. So I use Lunar Vim for this, which is fun. Um, for most of our templates, you have to install Cargo Leptos and then install the WASM32 unknown unknown target. Um, I've already done that, so I'm not going to do that, but it's pretty easy. Once you do that, you can use Cargo Leptos new to get one of the templates that somebody has made somewhere. Right, we've got a pretty broad uh, set of those. This one is a little bit more stripped down just so that I can implement stuff for you all. So this is the basic structure of a Leptos app, and we'll turn on the little side view here. Um, this one, this template is running on Axum, but we have a wide variety of backends that you could be running on. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with Axum, for example, if you were to look at the main here, you'd be pretty basic, right? We've got a, our main function, it runs the Axum router, um, you know, it serves it. Um, the interesting part with this page is dot leptos underscore routes and some of the setup that we do for that. Basically, we set up a trait that lets you almost ignore this file for routing. It will automatically re-render um, and add routes for any Leptos routes that you add. So we're not going to be back here, but I thought it would be fun to mention. Uh, let's go look at app. So as I said, this is a basic Leptos component. Um, it's got a style sheet that we load in from a static link. It's got a title tag, uh, components. It is basically HTML and CSS with little bits of Rust sprinkled in, RSX maybe, or RXML. We don't really have a name for that that I know of. Um, so let's run this example. Oops, not that. Let's run this example and see what we get. Uh, we have pretty much cargo and cargo-like commands, right, in our cargo leptos system, you know, you can do build, you can do run, um, but today we're going to do watch, and I'm going to add the hot reload flag here um, for other reasons we'll talk about in a little bit. So now it should be loaded in our browser, and I will go to here and reload, right, white screen, H1, that's all that we have in here so far. Um, let's, so if we're building a counter, right, we need to add 
a way to store the count. And because I don't have a database, and this is a very simplistic example, um, we're going to go back to main here, and we're going to create a little mutable wrapper that we can pass in. So I can do let count um, arc, <laughs> whoops, yes, rw lock uh, i64, say. Uh, and we'll set that to the default. So everything in main runs the first time you load it, right? It runs on startup. And then it goes into the event loop uh, down at the bottom with Axum serve. So we're going to create the default one up here. And then we're going to pass it to Leptos. I'm going to modify the Leptos routes a little bit to add some additional context. It's still looking good. OK. And basically, the way we can do that is we can stick that count into, whoops, I'm not in, not in that. I need to do a closure here. It's always closures with Leptos. Closure, provide context, and count. Probably have to clone it um, because so many things in here are dependent on, uh, we probably don't need these brackets either now that I think about it. Let's see how that goes. Ah, right, we haven't imported RW lock or the other thing. So we'll do use standard sync. RW lock and arc. OK, so it should be somewhat happy. Ah, this is a very common issue. As I said, we, we have problems with the need to black screen. No, coming back. All right. With, the need, with how ownership works inside of a UI system, right? It's pretty common, I think, amongst the UI frameworks, but we just need to add a little move here to say that it can keep that clone, right? And that compiles, and nothing is going to change here because I haven't changed anything, but that's all set up now. So now we can go do something fun. Let's go to our app RS, and let's create a server function. And the reason I'm creating a server function here is that I want to return data from the server to the front end. By default, right, nothing that Leptos has on the back end is sent to the front end. You have to do that explicitly. Right? And one way to do that is to use a server function. If you had an external API or something, you could do a fetch request, um, something like that. But we're not going to do that. Whoops. They need to be async. Uh, server functions are really neat. They're one of my favorite features. Uh, let's do get post. They're one of my favorite features because they really make that process easy. Right? When we call this, we're just going to call it like a regular um, Rust function from the client code. It doesn't take any arguments, and it returns a result with some type. In this case, we'll say i64. And it returns a server function error. Like so, we'll do OK. Sorry about that. I don't know why it's doing that, but OK. So I guess it's common for the room. We'll, we'll deal with it. OK, so we've got this. Um, so from context, we can get the arc rw lock, right? Uh, what, what should I call that? Uh, count wrapper. The Leptos context is nice because it basically creates a tree of um, items from, that you can pass in at different levels and then extract out. Um, so that you can avoid prop drilling by using the context here, um, which is why I can get away with getting the count wrapper without actually adding it as an argument to the function, right? Uh, arc, rw lock, i64. The, co the context is keyed by the type. So you can only have one arc rw lock i64 in here unless, um, 
unless they're in separate parts of the graph. If they ever get on the same level, you can run into issues where one will replace the other, uh, which happens sometimes. Okay. So we've got expect context here. If I look at this type, it's still unknown. Why is it unknown? Hmm. Well, we'll come back to that. It's still happy. So, ah, oh, cannot, right, cannot, we've got to import arcs again. Ah, the fun of Rust. So if you look at this here now, it's complaining about that, but it's an ARC RW ARC I64. Well, we can pull out um, count wrapper dot read, right, because it's an RW lock, and that's how you get a read handle to the thing in the RW lock. Um, let's count equals, and let's, I'm assuming this returns a lock result. I don't think I need this question mark, but we'll find out. Okay. Expected, ah, we do need that question mark, right? Found enum result, because that can fail, right? Um, I'm not actually well versed enough in the RW or crate or lock crates to tell you why, but, and this needs to be dereferenced here. All right, so we're back to compiling. We've got our server function. Uh, we've got the get, and I don't know why I called it get post. Get count. That makes more sense. All right, so we'll go back to the home page here, and now I want to get that bit of information out of, um, from my server function inside my component. So the component, right, is regular Rust. It's a regular Rust function, and then the HTML goes in the view function. So we've got our little, h1 for the title. And I, I have a built-in formatter, so I don't really know why I'm doing this, but sure. OK. So the way that to get data from a server function or some other thing on page load is to use a resource, right? So we can define a resource, create resource, right? And the reason that we create this structure for a resource is that Async functions in this kind of need to be managed, right? It might be loading, it might be okay, it might be error. We need to be able to tell Leptos what to do if those situations occur. Um, and the create resource argument, whoops, takes a tuple of dependencies. In this case, we don't really have any right now. And then we'll call the function, I don't know why I keep doing that get count here as if, as because it's a regular Rust function, right? Ex oh, and this also needs to be a closure that takes a tuple argument that I don't care about. And we're good to go with the resource. So now, remember how I said that the, um, we need to manage that state and show different things dependent on what it is? Well, uh, we do that with either a suspense or a transition component here. The suspense will render the fallback if, um, if it is still loading, and if it's not loading and return a result, we can tell it what to do here. The default fallback, which I could define, but I'm going to leave blank, is nothing. Um, so maybe we'll define a fallback that says, you know, loading. Sure. Why is that? That's a weird font effect. Um, anyway. Yeah. View. I don't know. Let's say that's a p tag, and we'll put in loading. Uh, the neat thing that we've done now is that you can either quote it or not quote things inside of tags. Um, I usually end up quoting them, but I'm not very consistent, just so that Rust Analyzer is a little bit happier, right? Uh, but it's up to user preference for that. I'm going to suspense. And then because we have implemented, um, because we have 
implemented the types necessary, we should just be able to call count resource in here, and we should get something. Um, but before I do that, let's, let's label it. Let's make it a little nicer. Uh, span count, same. And we'll close the span. And maybe the formatter will kick in here. OK. So now if I look at the page, um, you can now see that it's got count zero, right? Because the default of an ARC RW lock I64 is zero. So we've basically accomplished our goal of showing the count on the page. But we need to do a little bit more if we want to edit it, right? We need um, to make it more interesting. We need to be able to update that thing. So to update that thing, I like to create another Rust function, server function here. It has the same type, basically, because it's still going to return an i64 and a server function error, which means I probably could have copy-pasted it. There you go. And again, we're going to return this. Um, one way that you could get the value here is I could just say let count equals get count, right? The Rust function above that we're getting the count from because it is a regular Rust function. There's nothing particularly special about it. Um, we could do that. But um, I should point out that that can lead to lock contention, and somebody's probably going to say, you know, why didn't you just get it from the ARCRW lock, right? The answer is that you can. I'm just going to do it this way. Uh, expected function args, and I forgot the parentheses here. Um, we need to add some items here. We need to know how much to increment this by um, when we do that. So let's add an argument to our server function, an i64. And then we can get, we can update that value, right? Let count equals count plus increment by and return the new count. Unless I need to put a question mark here again. OK. So we talked about resources as a thing that exists in Leptos. Those are great for getting things when the page loads. They'll start loading on the server and be streamed down when they're done. Um, but sometimes you'd want a different thing. Sometimes you want an action, right? You want to be able to trigger a server function based on some principle. And we call that an action. Uh, and that's what we're going to do with this. We're going to create you know, that structure. So uh, let's do an action. Oops, I'll do it up here. Server functions and actions are tightly coupled together to make our lives easier. Um, we have a create server action that basically avoids most of the boilerplate of creating a regular action, which you could use to call any regular Rust function. But we're doing server functions here, so we can just tell it that we want to use the get count server function. Sorry, not get count. Um, the name of the generated struct that the server generates oops, um, is the combination of this converted to, not camel case, the opposite of that. Um, I forget what it's called. But basically, you capitalize the two words and remove the underscore. And where's the server action? Here. OK. So we'll put this in. All right, so it's still compiling. I think it'll be happy. But we need to add a method to trigger that. And coupled with the action, let's, let's, let's make this a little more descriptive. Let's say update count action. Sure. Um, coupled with that, tightly coupled, is the action form, which is basically a regular form where we have a little bit of boilerplate where we can just refer to the action that we created instead of having to worry about setting up the routing. Right? The server function will create a REST endpoint that's publicly accessible. And by doing this, we will tell, we, it will automatically fill in what that route is. No, none of that. And it works exactly how you would like, how you would expect a form to work. 
you've got inputs. Um, the name is the argument to your rest function, right? So we, our argument was called increment by, and we can say this is a type number. And yeah, that should be pretty basic. Maybe I throw in a little h1 to delineate when that starts, which probably is not what I should do, but I'm going with it anyway. Update count. I'm realizing now that I forgot the trigger. So we do that with a basic button. Button type equals submit, just like a regular form. And we can say update and close button. Okay. So assuming I did this right and didn't screw it up, which is a pretty big assumption, yeah? It's automatically reloaded the page, and now we have a form with a little update form. And let's see if we, what happens when I try to add to it. Let's, I'm going to add 3 to 0, update, nothing happens. But if I reload this page, nothing happens. That's annoying. <laughs> let's see if I hit update again, what's going to happen? Well, we don't get an error, so that's pretty good. Uh, let's see. I'm not updating the, you are absolutely right. I didn't actually update the storage. Um, so let's update the storage, right? Uh, writer equals, what did I call that thing? Oh, I need to get out of the context first. You'd almost think that I wrote this once before, almost. Uh, count, no, I didn't, when I did it earlier, I defined a type alias, so I didn't have to write arc rw lock all the time. And I probably should have done that here, but I didn't. Just know that you can't do that. Uh, put that in, let's do a question mark, and then we can do writer.write for an rw lock. And we'll say, um, I'm really good at naming things on the stand, so that's now writer2. And then we can say writer2 equals new count. And we should have updated everything. Question mark operator, all oh, right, because expect context actually doesn't return a wrapping type. Type standard, oh, but this needs a question. and mutable. Okay, L looking promising, right? So if we go back here, now we have count zero, we have update count three, hit update again, that doesn't update, but if I reload the page, count is now three. The reason that it didn't update, right, is that we didn't tell that resource that's doing the loading on the page that we, are depend that we need to reload that item if the server function runs, right? So if you look at here, as I mentioned, the first thing is a list of dependents for get count. But it is also a list of things that um, trigger that to refetch. So we can take that action that we defined update counts action, and we can say, you know, we want the version of it, which will update every time it successfully runs, or doesn't successfully run, and we want to get the value of that. Version is a signal, like most of the things here, and this needs to be above there, because Rust, that's how Rust works. Closure may outlive, oh, need another move. Closure outlive is one of those things that you just you get used to. Okay. So now if I look at this and I run it again, you can now see that it updated itself. Not as elegantly as it could have, but every time I run this, it will automatically update the element in the page. And that's basically what we were trying to do. While I'm in here, I thought it would be fun to kind of try to show you the um, the functions of hot reload, because one of the things that I hear a lot is that, hey, I can't iterate very fast. This is going to be a little bit tricky because 
you know, I gotta keep switching windows. But if I, for example, go to the CSS for this, which is in here somewhere, I hope. Style, yes. It's install, okay. If I go here and edit, uh, edit the style, say background color or something, red. I save. If I look at that, it already did it, right? You can see at the bottom here that it's, yeah, it, it did it instantly. As long as you're doing changes to the HTML and CSS that don't require us to recompile, which depends on it, it will instantly do those changes you know, over here. And that's basically my live demo. So. So this is the starter that I started with. If anyone wants to go back and actually try that, um, you've basically built one of our starter templates at that point. Most of them have the count in it just as something to go in there and for people to look at. Um, now it's my job to tempt you We've gone through the what is Leptos, now we need to talk about why Leptos, right? And I've heard a lot of things about Leptos and WebAssembly that either aren't true or are kind of true, but not really in the day-to-day. -day. The first one is that the bundle size is too big. Uh, we'll look at a, um, one of the examples of benchmarks later, but the bundle size is usually less than, say, React. Obviously, we can't compare with a pure vanilla JS implementation, but it's quite competitive. The startup time is too slow. Um, WebAssembly loads more efficiently than JS, but as you'll see soon, the startup time still manages to beat some of the JS frameworks. Uh, that we need direct DOM access to the JS provided by the browser. Um, I mean, it would be nice to have that, but we found that that's not actually a performance benchmark either. And the last one we've already covered a little bit is compiling takes too long, right? Every framework that gets discussed has the JS framework benchmark put out by somebody named Krausit. I don't know his actual name. I'm attempting to pronounce his GitHub. But the link is here. Um, and it looks like this. I'm hoping no one can read that. <laughs> OK. Um, and no one can see that either. Well, anyway, the point of this slide, right, is that if you look on the second column to the right, you can see React hooks. And they're, they're scaled from fastest to slowest, right? So Leptos is doing pretty well there. Vanilla JS beats us, Svelte beats us, Solid JS beats us, but not Vue, not Angular, not React, right? And this benchmark kind of runs a bunch of examples that tr test rendering time for different things that are all listed here but you can kind of see that we're, we're doing pretty well with this, right? So that kind of throws out the window that WebAssembly is the limiting factor in performance, right? Compile times wise, if you remember the things that I showed you earlier, Patter took about five seconds um, for an incremental build. Uh, CBVA is about five seconds as well. Rust Adventure took two. Um, all of these things, I mean, I personally can live with a couple seconds to think about what I've just done. But if you can't, we do have that hot reload, as I mentioned, uh, which is this, right? Uh, I set up my own performance test because I'm curious and a little bit of a masochist. Um, I took my blog site and built it in both Remix plus Express.js and Leptos and Axum as closely to identical as possible. Um, the details are all kind of here. And then I put it under a lot of load and tried to see if it would buckle, right? The home page fetches three requests from a database, uh, SQLite in this case, and the HTML CSS logic are as close as I could get them you know, with a variant. We ran this on DigitalOcean with these specs, you know, a couple of vCPUs, four gigs of RAM, and the big pipe. So hopefully that's not a problem. This is one of, I mean, I love these graphs, right? This is Remix plus Express.js. This looks like a little clear, you might be able to see um, on the bottom, we've got request per second, latency on the side, and the heat map tells you how common that is um, in the distribution. And you can kind of see here that it starts at about 20 milliseconds, goes down a little bit because of the JIT compiler, and at about 100, 100 requests per second, it kind of starts to fall down, right? That's, that's not a great place to be in your curve, 
right? Leptos did quite a bit better, right? Uh, it's flatter for longer. The variance in the latency is less. And you can kind of see the we're good all the way up to roughly 1,000 requests per second, you know, which is a very substantial difference, right? It is a, and that translates directly to infra costs. If you have to run a server and your server can run 10x more requests, you've saved money. You can get a smaller server. And that's the takeaway I took from this example. I'm sure it's not perfect, um, but it, it makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, the other benefit you get is Rust type system and tooling. So if you remember from the demo, we could take the Rust types we generated on the back end and use them on the front end exactly the same. We didn't have to write a parser. We didn't have to use Zod. We didn't have to worry about serializing and deserializing. Just did it, right? That's amazing. Uh, we get types at compile time and runtime, and Rust's famous tooling, right? Cargo, Cargo Leptos, Rust format, all of these things are usually a joy to use. And then you compare that to some of the other options, and I don't know. I know which one I prefer, I should say. I ha do have to wonder how we got to this stage. I think it was us. We did this. Did this to ourselves. Mm. I'd like to not have to deal with that. One of the more interesting things that we found when I was reaching out to our commercial users um, is developer time. We are finding that because our tools, the Rust tools and the Leptos tools, do more work, um, they keep more things in the type system, that the complexity that you need to keep in your head is less. And that basically means that you can produce more complex things with less people. I debated how to show this, because I don't have Google's resources to do A-B testing on a bunch of stuff. Um, so I just got comments from these users, right? Um, the Patter, uh, Rakshish from Patter basically told us that the little bit more time you might spend dealing with the types in Leptos is um, more than offset by the need to do very little debugging and that it mostly works, which lets them focus on features and less on fixing bugs and putting out patches. The other problem I have with the Rust is slow to iterate item is that I don't think the first past the post is usually the delimiter of like a successful startup. I think the first person past the post who delivers a good experience is the one that's going to succeed. And that makes it easier. Chris Piscardi, as I mentioned, uh, he's doing one of the other talks in the other rooms right now. Uh, basically says the same thing, that it lets him develop more with less effort. Um, uh, Alex from the CBVA, California, not from, but the developer who wrote the CBVA Association. You know, I really should get like, I want to put that on a card. You know, it's like I'm Ben from the California Beach Volleyball Association. That'd be kind of fun. Anyway, he was saying that the performance of it with almost no effort was enough to handle on beaches with poor LTE, right? The internet reception on beaches is not great, usually. I want to shout out to the Leptos Discord. We've got a lovely group of people working in there. They help us with answering questions. They generate community crates. You know, it has been amazing to have them. Our next release is coming out sometime soonish, probably not six months from now, but not today. Um, we've already got some fun things in the pipeline. Uh, most interesting for this. Is for your, the users, at least, is that we're going to take the reactive system that we define with the signals and make it more generic. We're going to improve async data loading a little bit, and we're going to get even more performance out of it, right? Hopefully, I've succeeded to tempt you to at least try it. Um, if you were not paying attention or going to sleep, here are roughly the reasons that we suggest it, right? As I mentioned, join us, Discord, uh, our website, GitHub, all of these things are free and open source. We'd love to have you. And that, comes, that brings me to the end of the talk. <laughs>